Hi everyone, my name is Jenny Lee and I'm a professor in the Department of Educational Policies and Practice at the University of Arizona. And I am uh, looking forward to sharing with you a bit about what I know, as well as the work I've been doing uh, for the past couple of decades in relation to racism and nationalism in international higher education. So, Oftentimes I'd like to just, when I give a lecture or share with my students, this helps um, for the audience to know a little bit more about the speaker and their context and view that shapes their understanding. And so this photo that you're seeing now is one of the Sonoran Desert. It divides the United States and Mexico. The next photo is actually of that same division between the United States and Mexico. This is between uh, San Diego, California, and Tijuana, Mexico. And what I'm demonstrating here is just even within the same border, we're seeing various degrees of, of enforcement, of demand, but also as you're seeing up on top, the, the very stark difference in the urbanization on the right side of Tijuana and the relatively uh, less urban or somewhat rural uh, perspective that we're seeing on the left side of the border. And when we're seeing these different disparities, it helps us to get a, a fuller understanding of just the different types of tensions, demands, and the context that separates one country from another. This is a photo of the most militarized border in the world, and this is separating North and South Korea. I was born in Korea, raised in San Diego, and my mother actually uh, was born in what is now known as North Korea and fled during the war, and my family relocated to what is now South Korea. And another very different border. This is where I've been spending the past eight years uh, living part-time in South Africa. This is a border that separates Zimbabwe from South Africa. And what we're seeing across all these different photos are different depictions of national borders, some highly mil militarized, highly securitized, and others much more porous. But we are seeing across all is a demand for one place for another based on the conditions that people may leave in seeking opportunities, safety, uh, better quality of life, job opportunities that they may not find elsewhere. Underlying this, and as we think about internationalization and really internationalization, meaning across national borders is also an underlying fundamental uh, view that I hope we can uh, better understand through this presentation and that is of human rights. Um, that internationalization, crossing borders is not a neutral process. It could be a very violent process, um, in many ways, uh, life-threatening. Uh, so this is a, the photo on the, uh, what you're seeing on the upper right, uh, Syrian refugees on the left, a more recent depiction of um, Afghanistan, and even in my home state of Arizona, of detention centers of those seeking um, asylum in the United States based on conditions in their home countries. And this is often the side that we don't want to look at, is, um, can be quite upsetting, and not necessarily the first things that come to mind when we think about internationalization, but this is the reality for many in the conditions that would lead someone to seek safety, refuge, or simply better opportunities in another part of the world. So when we think about immigration in particular, it is highly politicized um, and can really divide people in regard to how they support or not support uh, immigration, including international students and scholars. And Trump clearly had a significant impact in the US positioning uh, throughout the world in um, immigration in particular. And really, the unlike the previous administration, what Trump um, platform was a more anti-immigration stance in limiting those coming from other countries and more suspicion about those coming from abroad. Um, this has now since been rescinded, but travel bans against those from Muslim majority countries, which certainly did impact 
um, international higher education in the United States, um, a closer watch on social media profiles, uh, the extent to which that might um, indicate some um, intention to do harm um, and how that was being looked upon, um, but even limiting the U uh, US university's ability to um, attract or recruit those from abroad, limiting uh, skilled visas and limiting the entry of international students in all sorts of ways. But this is not just happening in the United States. Um, as an example, um, I mentioned earlier that I had spent some time in South Africa in 2015. You know, the kind of uh, anti-immigrant stance is not a US only phenomenon as you already well know. Um, but for example, the Zulu King had referred to those from abroad as quote, headlights that should be squashed and foreigners should pack their belongings and leave the country. And this was a statement made by the tribal king of over 10 million Zulu people in South Africa. These are the kind of effects that we see in xenophobia. Partly it can be triggered maybe quite easily by our own national tribal um, leaders who may then um, incite some violence. Uh, this is actually a photo um, that was taken not too far from where I was living from South Africa at the time. There was a lot of um, violence, but also uh, much protesting for the lack of um, police presence and, and safety uh, when uh, xenophobic violence occurs. Uh, so that is one way. Another way is uh, just in how we all think about entry to one country to another. So this is um, a photo that was taken, uh, again, close to where I live, um, near Tucson, Arizona. Um, individuals who were seeking to come to the United States and was arrested. But at the same time, depending on the country that you come from, there are more familiar ways to enter. And much of that is based on your country of origin or citizenship. The issue of xenophobia also occurs in homogeneous countries as well. This is a, a photo that was taken a protest of um, ethnic minority group that was seeking labor um, fairness and a protest that was done in, in South Korea. Even supporting immigrants, um, even assisting them with their own safety uh, in the case of, again, in the case of Arizona, um, can be deemed criminal. And so this is um, a photo of water that is being left behind for those that are crossing the desert. Um, hundreds die every year crossing the Sonoran Desert um, in seeking a, a better opportunities and safety. Um, in the United States and individuals would leave um, water just unattended uh, for those who need it to have and as a way to save lives. Um, and there have been cases of individuals even being arrested for supporting uh, that. And throughout the world at the same time, we're seeing um, the rise of populism and in particular, we're seeing, especially in Western Europe, uh, as well as the, the United States, uh, individual groups, white supremacists, far right um, parties that are seeking to uh, maintain um, their power, but also eyeing internationals, so-called foreigners from particular countries as a threat. And there is a, a rise of um, political parties and those elected officials um, who support these types of um, white supremacist um, movements and, and groups. And what we're seeing as well, just throughout the world and particular uh, um, political parties rising in power, um, very far right extremists being selected um, as mainstream politicians is also this anti-immigrant stance that is gaining popularity in parts of the world where immigrants are being posed as threats. Um, despite the research that uh, undoubtedly indicates that internationals are good for the economy, they create job growth, 
um, that there are many benefits for even nationalists to, to gain. Um, and yet a common move throughout history has been for politicians to view internationals as scapegoats, um, especially if with um, uh, globalization, you know, there are parts of the world, you know, with urbanization uh, sectors and groups that are feeling that they have less power or a declining quality of life. In times of economic downturn, uh, we often see that immigrants or internationals are viewed as the scapegoats uh, unfairly um, to blame for uh, any unfavorable or conditions or declining quality. Um, and again, the research uh, indicates the opposite, but we see this throughout the media, throughout the world. So if there's a framework to help understand what I'm talking about more broadly, and I will tie this into international higher education as well, is this new racism. And what I'm referring to is not the typical traditional, I hate to use the word typical, but the more commonly understood form of racism based on one's phenotype but rather a new form of racism that we're seeing increasing throughout the world. I mean, it's something I wrote about over a decade ago and still seems to be unfortunately becoming more and more um, commonplace. Uh, so what this is, this is a racism to include stereotypes of one's culture. And when I say the superiority of cultures, this isn't the kind of racism where I, uh, as an Asian American, would be treated the same as an Asian as an Asian international. Um, there's a difference, and that's what neo racism points to: is that being of U.S. culture has a sense of superiority, um, where I might not experience the same kind of discrimination as. Um, a Korean international student who has a Korean accent and espouses a Korean culture in a way that I do not. So we're talking about a difference in culture, but a stereotype of one's culture and a sense of superiority of culture. So that's why this is not um, simply branded as xenophobia. It's not a broad fear of foreigners, but it's a sense of superiority as when uh, Trump had indicated that uh, you know he does not want um, immigrants from as whole countries, but uh, not too long after also talked about how he would welcome more immigrants from Norway. So again, there's a sense of superiority um, from uh, the perspective of neo-racism that there are particular parts of the world that are more favorable than others and is used to maintain these hierarchies of oppression globally is also used to justify marginalizing certain groups over others. And so neo-racism may be quite overt as I will demonstrate, but also can be quite subtle. And the rhetoric that is often used um, in neo-racism is that this is a way to preserve what it means to be an American, whatever that means, You know what it means to uh, maintain our French culture, what this means to be a true, um, um, you know, uh, loyal uh, patriot of, um, of Sweden, right? Like it's, there are different ways that the rhetoric is being used um, in order to maintain separation, a sense of superiority, but also is used to justify discriminatory acts because it's supposedly a way to maintain some false assumption of a homogeneous um, society. So within the US, I conducted numerous studies. What does this look like in US higher education? And neo-racism, the term has been around well before this particular publication, but in adapting this to higher education, uh, what I and my colleague found was there was definitely a difference in how internationals were treated. Not all internationals uh, experience the same, of course, but there are patterns in the world where individuals, uh, international students from Latin America, Africa, and um, Asia had experienced um, discrimination and challenges that were significantly different from those from, Cat Amer uh, Latin, um, from Canada, from Western Europe, from Australia. Uh, you know, so it's not a, a blanket form of xenophobia, but is also based on a form of neo-racism. It took, uh, there were many examples um, 
it's indicated in the publication, you know, verbal assaults, individuals being told to go back home, wherever that might be, um, physical assaults, threats. Uh, there was another study uh, that I conducted with a colleague looking specifically at um, African student athletes in the United States and how they were also subject to narrow stereotyping, even from uh, Black students in the United States these particular negative views about Africa and assuming that these athletes were coming simply to pro um, as opposed to taking their education very seriously and the, and the kind of discrimination based on stereotypes about um, African students that had surfaced um, in this particular study. There was another study looking also at postdocs um, much of the UK, where the study is based as well as the United States, is able to remain competitive because of the high demand for opportunities in um, UK and US top world class universities. But given the constant demand, there was also room for unfortunate uh, exploitation, where Asian postdocs in particular were uh, perceived as forms of temporary labor. Um, as opposed to being um, uh, having the same kind of opportunities and socialized and mentored to become uh, full time uh, permanent faculty. So we notice a clear difference in how Asian postdocs were being treated uh, versus the domestic postdocs in particular. There is also a term neo nationalism, and this also is uh, a form of neo racism but also emphasizes a country of, or, of, a country of origin and a superiority, not just of cultural order, but of national order, uh, focusing more so on a superiority of a, of a nation state versus another. And there's a few studies I had conducted in, in this area as well. And even within the same race, we can see patterns of uh, superiority, a sense of superiority and mistreatment based on one's uh, country of origin. Uh, this was observed um, in the way that Chinese students felt that they were being treated in South Korea, how Zimbabweans and Nigerians suffered um, discrimination within South Africa. And across both studies, there were similar patterns of uh, these groups um, experiencing social isolation, challenges in connecting with locals, even of those of the same race, uh, challenges in securing housing, um, you know, some being overcharged uh, based on stereotypes of, of internationals coming from extreme wealth, or simply not wanting to rent to internationals based on stereotypes, um, you know, about cleanliness or about their ability to, to pay. There were also verbal assaults, and again, within the same race. So what is underlying much of this, especially what is happening most recently, we are continuing to see education as an arms race. And what I mean by that is when there is an arms race, there's no end in sight. There is basically a comparison being made to another, but underlying that is a form of competition. We're now in our uh, knowledge society or some would refer to as a knowledge economy, where now higher education is a form, uh, a direct form of development, but also a direct form of a measure being used to, to see us to um, help identify uh, where one is in relation to another, spurring on competition between countries. And I'm going to next just talk about my most recent work and a clear example of that in the US versus China, the leading producers of scientific knowledge in the world. And in the United States and over the past few years, and this continues, is the notion of China as a threat. This has not always been the case, but more recently, as China has be, uh, rose in power and rose in scientific production, uh, now the China long uh, viewed as an ally is now being positioned as an adversary. And these are just some quotes that have been spoken by uh, those in the, the federal government, um, particularly in, in 2018, when this especially emerged, warning universities to um, be wary of Chinese students and scholars as potentially um, 
coming for malicious intent and for universities to secure and be uh, very watchful um, of ways that uh, intellectual theft may, may be occurring. So this underlying this stereotypical idea of, in this case, China, previous to that, those from other countries, um, but particularly in the, in the past few years, we've observed a numerous attempts to limit engagement with China. Um, this is just a list, and certainly you can uh, take a look at these uh, references. But as it relates to neo-racism against individuals in particular, there are headlines being made of professors, um, instructors, making these broad sweeping, sweeping claims about Chinese students and scholars, um, as well as uh, Chinese scholars being investigated uh, for, again, for intellectual theft. And the, even despite being cleared of charges, um, this, is, this had made wide news throughout the media. So yes, these are, there are um, negative stereotypes that exist against various groups um, you know, in the United States throughout the world, but this is the power of research. And yes, I mentioned earlier that US and China are the leading producers of scientific knowledge. Uh, what people may uh, not know or be less inclined to know is that they're also the biggest collaborators in the world. Um, so, so despite these geopolitical tensions, um, in a recent study with John Hout, we found that the US and China continue to collaborate on global problems, even despite the, the negative rhetoric coming from both countries. And even beyond that, if you look at this graph, we're finding the two upper incline in increasing lines is the production of China. That China is steadily uh, rising, uh, actually quite rapidly in the amount of um, scientific articles being produced. Um, the flat line is the United States. And what we're also seeing in comparing the US with or with China, we're finding that not only do these countries help one another in bolstering their own scientific production, but we can also see by the extent of the incline that the U.S. does not need, the U.S. actually does need China to maintain its incline, otherwise it would be flat. Um, so this is um, a paper in, in higher education, um, Lee and Hout 2020, that goes into further detail about that. But the bottom line, um, I like this quote, is that institutions that do not form international collaboration and countries that do not nurture their talent will lose out entirely. And you know, from a nationalist view, it could be that we don't need these countries, that these countries are coming to steal, these countries are coming um, to take away. Um, and this kind of frame is actually incorrect. Um, we're finding through this study that it's actually quite the opposite and that internationals have much to contribute even beyond this um, diagram uh, posted here. And so we find it, uh, through my most recent work, as I mentioned earlier, is that the US has more to lose than gain in restricting ties with China. So with all the legislation and the proposals um, being uh, offered to limit ties, it's actually hurting the United States um, from a nationalist view. And that neo-racism against Chinese individuals over the actual evidence would do more harm than good for the US, for China, as well as global science. So the last slide, I was asked to comment on what can universities through their faculty administrators do to interrupt the patterns of racism, xenophobia, and other forms of discrimination. And so there's many, many things we can do, and I'm sure you can come up with many um, uh, ideas based on where you are and, and your experience and what you have to offer. But I'll just uh, offer some just to get us thinking about this um, beyond the presentation. Uh, Self-awareness about racism versus racism. And at first I wrote awareness and I thought more that beyond that to educate ourselves. Um, clearly racism remains a significant uh, problem um, in the United States, in countries throughout the world, but also to identify that not all racism um, is just within our borders, that there may be an added layer of racism 
that extends to those from particular countries and that someone of the same race may have a, a different set of challenges than, than some of the same race from another country. The example I used earlier of an Asian American versus an Asian international, there's a different form of racism, uh, which I term as neo-racism for us to be aware of and to identify that if we experience or observe that ourselves. Uh, secondly, to build quality relationships based on mutuality. There's a lot of pressure um, to have these international partnerships, and I think for the most part, they're very well-intended, uh, but oftentimes may not um, recognize power dynamics um, and the different set of resources that one group may have over another. Um, it could uh, create some challenges um, and to think more about the mutuality in ways that multiple parties can benefit, can gain, um, and can um, grow. Also speaking out against discrimination. I think that goes without saying, but uh, you know, I, I have a wish that I could see more, um, especially individuals who feel that they are being um, mistreated may not necessarily be the first ones to speak out. Um, because they have uh, been victimized or silenced or just not have a platform. In what ways can we encourage um, more awareness about the kind of problems even within our own institutions? Um, as well as advocate on the accomplishments um, to celebrate the benefits that individual, uh, in, uh, international, individual internationals bring uh, to our own institutions, to our communities, to our countries. Um, and not just the financial, of course, but the ways that they uh, contribute to our own awareness, to our own critical thinking, to learning in classrooms, to the research that is being produced in collaboration with internationals or the internationals who are already here with us and the, and the impressive work that, that they are doing. I think all of that should uh, be noted um, and uh, really publicized uh, much for, more than it's um, oftentimes is. Uh, and lastly, as I demonstrated in the previous slide to this, is to research in ways that dismantle myths. There are a lot of studies on international students and scholars and internationalization, and I think that is great. When I started decades ago, there wasn't a lot in the higher education field, and now there is so much more that we know that we didn't know before. And I would encourage those researchers um, uh, in the audience to also focus on what are the prevailing myths that research can dismantle? What are the stereotypes that um, are not being questioned or checked? What are ways that we can push um, some of the, the prevailing stereotypes that feed into the discrimination that we're observing every day. And uh, I believe that that is also a, a really important way to create change and to address discrimination just through our own research. So thank you all for listening. Uh, please email me with any questions. Happy to send along any of the papers that I mentioned. And I wish you the best.